So, and we're going to uh, hear about sort of um, a nice interplay between psychology and biochemistry, which is uh, how should we think about drug testing and how should we think about My name is Anne Kajorka, and today I will be presenting on what makes for a banned substance the case for and against myogenate. So a little bit about why we care about this drug. Maria Sharapova, who you may or may not know as a tennis player, was actually banned for using this drug as of March 7th of this year. So she can't do any kind of competition whatsoever. And as like the world's highest paid female athlete, that's pretty much a big deal because it's like maybe Derek Jeter getting tested for steroids and then not being able to play baseball. So that was a big deal for the sporting world and it kind of jump-started this whole like how do we test for substances that are really kind of new to the um, sporting world, I guess. So a little bit about banned substances in general. It's any kind of drug that is used to enhance the performance of an athlete. So it's any kind of substance or compound that you take that would make you run farther or faster or jump higher or do all that kind of fun athletic things better than you would without them. And the World Anti-Doping Agency, or WADA, is basically the kind of overseer of all of these um, illegal drugs. They go around and they test for um, compounds that would enhance your performance and see what they do in your body and if they can be used to enhance your athleticism overall. And there's this world anti-doping code that they go by, which is basically a bunch of conglomerations of rules and regulations from around the country in different sports that focus on what an athlete can and cannot do during competition. And one of their main focuses is that they can't take any kind of drug either in or outside of competition. So if you're like in games right now in season or you're not in season or really you have any kind of competition in the near future or the past, you're not allowed to take them unless you are like retired like I am. Um, and they really like to, their motto is play true as you can see in their little logo over there and they really want to focus and um, bring a lot of attention to having athletes play the game with or play any kind of game, sport, competition with the um, focus on that your body was meant to do this originally and that you don't need any kind of steroids or anabolic drug help to do this. So a little bit about the um, substances that are used to enhance your overall athleticism. The first one is anabolic steroids, which you have all probably heard about, which are testosterone. And they are used to help you bulk up. They gain muscle, they help you hit harder or farther, I guess, in both senses of football and baseball and they really just kind of help you increase your overall muscle mass. The next ones are human growth hormones, which help improve your recovery time after any kind of competition. So this would be if you are lifting or if you're running, you would need less time to recover and to recuperate before you go into your next competition. So you're really not as tired as you would be, and it takes you less time to be able to get back into the competition, get back into the game after you've done something super strenuous. The last ones we're going to talk about are metabolic modulators, which increase the oxygen flow through your body. So these are ones that help keep the oxygen flow through your muscles and help them get less fatigued than they would if you weren't taking them. So you're lifting, or many of you, I can see, are athletes because I know you from that. And uh, when you're lifting, your muscles get tired, and when you're running, they get tired. And these kinds of substances will help increase that oxygen flow through your or to your muscles, and you won't get as tired as fast as you would without them. So about the history of myogenate, it was actually um, created in 1970 as an anti-ischemia drug. And anti or ischemia itself is basically just a decrease in blood flow through your body. So this drug helps increase that blood, throat, blood flow and increase that oxygen throughout your entire body and helps keep things moving smoothly. And it's manufactured in Latvia, as you can see here, it's between Sweden and Poland and Russia and Germany in that kind of Baltic Sea region. And you probably haven't heard about this drug before because it's not actually FDA approved in the United States. So you're not able to get this drug um, prescribed to you any other way unless you would go to, say, Latvia or talk to a manufacturer in that sense because the FDA is, doesn't allow it to be here. So as a pharmaceutical, like I said, it increases the blood flow to your body caused by ischemia. And it also has um, different kinds of roles with acute and chronic disturbances of the blood-brain supply. 
So that would be if you are a severe stroke patient and if you have damage to that supply in your brain. This drug helps keep the oxygen flowing, helps keep the blood um, going to your brain that would otherwise cause um, a lot of brain injuries and detrimental effects without that oxygen to your brain. And it also, interestingly enough, interestingly enough, also helps with the abstinence syndrome of chronic alcoholism. So that's basically the withdrawal symptoms that you would have if you are stopping um, drinking if you are an alcoholic. So these help keep the alcoholic or keep the person from relapsing from those really bad withdrawal symptoms and help them to move forward in that process of stopping their addiction. So in sports, like I mentioned, they are used to increase the endurance and um, rehabilitation after exercise, so they help you keep you trained longer and harder and more effectively than you would without them. And they also are used as a stress, stress protector. So you can take these um, drugs and you are more emotionally like, stable or more up in your emotions than you would be if you didn't take them. And a lot of you may know that if you take testosterone or any kind of steroids in that sense, People get really irritable, they're very easily angered, and they can kind of like Hulk smash everything because the world sucks kind of mentality. And this drug actually helps protect against that and gives people, puts people in a better state of mood, better state of mind while they are taking it. And it also enhances the central nervous system functions. And as you can see here, the central nervous system is basically kind of the um, brain and spinal cord area. And this is where a lot of neurons are found. And neurons are like little messengers for your body that kind of help sense your stimuli, help to send signals throughout your body on what is going on. So say you're a baseball player and a ball is coming in, these neurons help you react to the ball and help you swing in any timely manner. And the, this drug helps enhance those systems. So if you are a little slow or a little late on the ball and you would take myelogenate, you would actually increase your reaction time and be able to hit the ball better than you would be without them. So why is this drug banned? It's actually very recent. The petition to ban it actually came into effect as of September of last year, and then the drug itself was banned as of January. So a lot of new athletes, or a lot of athletes are being um, tested for this new drug because it's so recently banned and a lot of people may or may not have been taking it. Um, it is classified as an S4 substance under the water code. As I mentioned, it's a hormone and metabolic modulator, so it helps increase that overall oxygen flow to your body. And what a statement for this drug was that there was evidence of its use by athletes with the intention of enhancing performance. So they weren't just taking this drug for that ischemic effect, for that pharmaceutical effect. Um, they were actually taking this to enhance their overall athletic ability, um, specifically in that manner, instead of any other kind of clinical reason. So how do you detect these banned substances? So like I mentioned, WADA has, is this kind of group that goes around and tests for different kinds of substances, and they test to see what's going on, what's new, what people are taking, like how they work throughout their body, and if they have any kind of suspicion whatsoever that they could be used as a doping agent, then they go through really intense, actually, tests to make sure that, um, to make sure that the test or the drug that they're banning is actually doing these things, and then they go through and ban them, and then they go and test athletes randomly to see if anybody in those uh, competitions are taking them. And to do that, they test the urine and the blood of the athlete. So the blood, when you take a drug, the drug is metabolized into your bloodstream, into your circulation, and you can detect concentrations of it via the blood, or via that, those tests, and you can see if somebody is taking a drug or not. And they also test the urine because once that drug is metabolized through your body, once it gets um, circulated through, it gets excreted through your urine, and you can also detect amounts of drug that have not been metabolized and are readily seen in that sense. And athletes were getting pretty smart about this, and like, if people are testing my blood and my urine there, how can I hide this? How can I mask what I'm doing to make sure that nobody can find, find out that I'm taking these illegal drugs? So how, how do you, how do you detect, or how do you hide these banned drugs? They focus a lot on the pharmacokinetics of the drugs and the substances that you're taking. So the half-life, which is basically the amount of time that it takes for the concentration of the drug to decrease by half. 
or the solubility of it, whether it is easily um, gone through your bloodstream or it gets kind of caught in fat, fatty areas of your body. And one of the substances that they would use would be a diuretic, and if you all drink coffee, which college students do a lot of, um, a coffee is a diuretic which helps increase your urine production and that would help flush out your system, flush the drug through your body, and basically kind of decrease that concentration to a level where it's not easily detected if you were to be randomly drug selected for a test. And they also use masking agents, which are chemical compounds used to interfere with drug tests. So, say you are taking a banned substance, then you take another masking agent. That masking agent would help produce a false negative on the test, so you can't actually be detected for taking a banned substance. But water has gotten really smart about that, and now they have tests for the masking agents, so you can't really get away with that anymore. So a little bit about who actually gets tested. It's, they're randomly selected. Um, it's not really a certain kind of, let's test all baseball players, let's taste, test all football players or all female athletes or not. It's just kind of like if you have a suspicion that somebody is taking it, or even if you don't have a suspicion, you can just pick randomly any one athlete and test their blood and or urine to see if they are doping or not. And a lot of Russian and Latvian athletes are actually getting tested more often than not because of this drug and it's so readily available in that, in that region that many of them are being found to have been taking these drugs and a lot of them are banned now from their respective competitions because they're all taking it. So moving on to a little bit about the history of detection. It was first carried out in the 1972 Olympic Games and they used a test called gas chromatography to test for stimulants in the body, which basically kind of activates all of your bodily functions. And I'll go into the, what the tests actually are in a few slides. And then in 1983, they advanced these kind of detection tests to include mass spec as well as gas chromatography to just um, screen all the urine samples from the athletes that were in that grouping. And then in 1996, they also had another advance, which was basically just kind of um, getting a test that was much more specific and much better at detecting any other um, drug and the anabolic agents, which are the testosterone drugs, as I mentioned in the first couple slides. So in the research that I looked at, they had two kinds of um, approaches to look for malginate use. The first one was to detect the drug at the lowest possible workforce for the lab. And that was a mixture of liquid chromatography and mass spec. And that was because they, there are so many athletes out there, there are so many different kinds of samples and um, drugs that you could be testing for that they didn't really want to have to spend a lot of time, didn't want to spend a lot of money or manpower on having to test for these substances. So they wanted to make it super easy, super fast, so that a lot of samples could be tested at one general time. And then once they found out that these sample or these tests could find those samples. They use something called hydrophilic interaction liquid chromatography, high resolution, high accuracy mass spectrometry to basically just kind of confirm that their tests were doing the right things. And if you were all thinking what I was when I read that, you're like, what on earth is that test? Because it's a lot of words and really big and science is hard. <laughs> so <laughs> the first, they basically focus a lot on polarity, which is the opposing charges of a molecule. As you can see here, this is a water molecule. And on the top, we have a negative charge and then two positive charges on the bottom. And this polarity determines a lot of the physical characteristics of the molecule, like boiling point, solubility, or surface tension in the example of water again. And any kind of addition of another molecule to this polarity or to, the, to this molecule can affect the overall polarity. So if you are boiling water, just regular water, it has a certain boiling point. But say you add salt to that boiling water, it increases the boiling point and it will boil hotter than what it would without the salt. So going into the actual test, what is chromatography? This is an example of column chromatography, which is kind of a basic example of a chemical test. And you use that to purify a single compound from a mixture. So here we have the mixture that they put in, and based on the polarity, they interact with the column, the polarity of the column, and separate out and exit the column at separate times, which is the retention time. So say this, this red substance would have a lower retention time than the blue one because it elutes from the column much faster than the red. 
or from the blue. And the differences in polarity of the mixture or of the compounds makes them elute at different times. So they react with the column and then come out based on how they interact with the column itself. So these are the results that they had from the liquid group chromatography. On the bottom you can see a time excess and then a signal intensity. So they tested the blank urine sample just as a control to make sure that there wasn't anything funny going on with their testing to kind of blank out their um, chromatography and to make sure that everything was going smoothly. And then this is a spiked urine sample, which they didn't actually know if it contained malginate or not. And then they compared it to a sample that they knew com or contained malginate um, itself. And as you can see, the retention times are very, very similar. So they could kind of conclude that this is malginate, or there is malginate in this sample, and that they could go forward with their test to confirm that this was actually the drug that they were looking for. So to confirm this, they were like, okay, so a lot of compounds have the same retention time, so how can we be sure that this is actually the specific one compound that we're looking for? They need another test to um, verify that and to make sure that, yes, this is malgenate, or yes, this kind of looks like malgenate, but no, it's really not. And to do that, they looked at mass spectrometry, and that basically looks at the masses of a molecule in um, a spectrum, so it detects this little detection guy, it detects the mass of a molecule as it goes through this um, tube. So when you would enter, this would be where the urine comes in, and then it becomes ionized, or the compound basically gets electron shot at it, and then it can split apart, where in the example of magnesium, you'd have magnesium plus and an electron. And then it goes through this tube and helps it accelerate through, and based on how heavy or how light the molecule is, determines the amount of time it takes for it to detect. So say you have like a baseball and then you have a medicine ball or something super heavy like that. And you can easily throw a baseball really far and really fast, whereas a medicine ball you probably couldn't throw very far or very fast. Or in my case I can't because I'm not that strong. So that they just they're able to detect how heavy the the compounds are once they split apart and be able to determine the different molecules that are coming out. And this is the result of the malginate urine sample. So here you can see that when this molecule splits off, it comes out much faster and is much lighter than the, than the other part of the molecule. And they're just basically showing that it was a more com confirmational uh, test to show that malginate was actually in the sample and to make sure that this is what they were looking for. And then as another confirmational analysis, they synthesized their own malginate molecule. So they used an isotope of hydrogen, which is basically another form of the hydrogen element. Right here, as you can see the D, we have a CH3 and then a CD3. And they compared that and used different tests to be able to make sure that it was, the test was specific enough to be able to test minor differences in a molecule. So we have this, this is their mass spec for the um, synthesized molecule. And as you can see here, they have the same general peaks with the same general weights in the same um, areas. And also over here, you can see that the other, this part of the molecule came out later because it's more heavy. And then here is a comparison of both of them. So you can see here that the first peak was 58 for the normal malginate and then 61 for the isotope that they made. So even though they're very similar, they're basically the same molecule with that one little isotope difference, it was able to be specific enough to test that minor three, three point difference than it would have been, or then, yes. So that means basically that their test was super specific and that this was a good way to detect whether or not the drug was in the system. And if we go through all of the rest of the, the weights, there are, they're very similar, but yet just slightly different enough where they're not the same, but they're still easily detected by this test. So a little bit about where Maria actually is now. She had a hearing for this drug case or for the Yes, 
as of May 18th, but I don't actually know what's going on with that hearing because they don't publicize that, so I can't tell you what's going on in it, but I just know that it happened or is happening. And their main argument is the pharmacokinetics of the drug is that the half-life of it is only about four hours. So if she stopped taking the drug, what she says she did, then the test should have proved that she wasn't actually taking it or there wasn't enough in the system in her system to ban her from tennis in general. And that could actually bring her back into tennis competitions as of July this year, which is the 2016 Wimbledon. So that was that's a pretty big deal to ban somebody and then have a test hearing based on the pharmacokinetics of the drug and how it interacts with your body and to basically unban them from something that they got tested positive for. So, in conclusion, this case, this Marie Sharapova case, actually helped WADA and helped um, different systems kind of um, determine how they handle the banned substances if they are brand new, like how they should test for these, how they go about this, how to make sure that what they're testing for is actually what they're testing for instead of some off compound that may or may not be what they want. They also were able to find a definitive, cost-effective, and very quick method to determine banned substance use. And this is really beneficial considering there are thousands and thousands of athletes out there that could potentially get tested at one time. And to be able to have this kind of test that is super efficient and very easy to do is really helpful in that sense for doping, I guess, and athletics in general. And there are my references. Testosterone 
has a different, is made a different way than testosterone in mammals. And so that means there's a big, big difference between them. Yeah, I think that's what they were trying to do with like the isotope thing because carbon-13 is different and they wanted to see if it was specific enough or like to look at if they could detect the isotopes of it if there were any kind of differences, but I, no, that's just an inference. You're, well, you're exactly right. The reason that, they're, that the isotope method is great for this is that you can't say like, oh, well, maybe my body makes no more. Yeah, so because it wouldn't make the isotope. Yeah. Sorry, does your body actually make any of this? Uh, you mentioned that like counters the effects of like steroids and whatnot. Do you know if people are mostly taking this for its own effects or like also to count that? Like, malogenate or yeah, malogenate. Or people mostly taking malogenate on its own or like yeah, they were taking it basically yeah just to increase their endurance and stuff by themselves. Any other questions? Okay, let's thank our speaker. We have a 20 minute bathroom break at this point, and then uh, Karen will be giving her talk. So, bathroom break. <laughs>